Hey guys, it's Mr. Lowry. Um, this is the assignment that we did in class on 11-9 Monday, if you're in Cohort A, and this will also be for 11-10 or Tuesday uh, for Cohort B. Um, this is just a little bit of in-class practice that we did with functions and function notation. One of the things we talked about when we talked about relations and functions is that there's different ways to represent them. One of the ways that we can represent a function is with an equation, a literal equation. So problem one here um, is all about using a literal equation. And this is the equation that we're going to end up using. Uh, and we're going to use inputs and outputs to be able to um, answer different questions here. Um, on the back side here, we have problem two, which is um, a function in table form. And then problem number three is a function in graph form. So we have several different representations of functions that we need to be able to understand and interpret, and we also want to be able to use function notation with each of those. Okay, um, so there's some there's some good information here that you can um, kind of read through and and uh, get get a little bit of extra information. Some of this we already talked about in class, but I really like this down here. This is kind of a a quick guide here. So it says, remember, f of negative 3 means negative 3 is your input, and you plug it in for x. Okay? Down here, it says f of negative 3 means that your whole function is equal to negative 3, and you plug into the y. So remember that f of x is basically just a fancy y value. Okay? The number inside the notation, inside the parentheses here, is the input. So when they give you something that looks like this, they're giving you the input of the function. And they usually want you to find the output. All right, let's take a look at what we have here. So problem number one. It says the function f of s equals 8s plus 15 represents the costs of ordering s shirts. What are the domain and range of the function? OK. So the input is s, right? The input, the, the letter that's inside the parentheses is s. And that stands for shirts. And there's another s there. So that stands for shirts also f of s stands for the cost of a bunch of shirts. So um, all the possible input values would be the domain. So we want to go input um, or the domain. All right, domain is all the input values. Um, is equal to, we're going to do a set here. And then we're going to list all the different possibilities of inputs we have. Now remember that inputs in this context stands for shirts, uh, or, or shirts are the inputs here. So if you think about what kind of sh an amount of shirts that we can order, we can't order negative shirts. That doesn't make sense. We could probably order, I don't know, would it make even would it make sense to order zero shirts? Probably not. So we probably need to start with one shirt. One is probably the smallest shirt order that we would do here. Okay, now we can't order like a half of a shirt or three quarters of a shirt or anything like that. So what we want is whole numbers and we don't want any in-betweens. So like one and two and three, right? Those are all different numbers of shirts that we can order, four and so on. I'm gonna put a dot, dot, dot here that just means and so on, okay? Now, we don't want to use the, the phrase all real numbers because remember that negatives don't count, decimals and fractions don't count in this context, so we don't want those. Um, we also wouldn't want to say x greater than or equal to 1 because, again, that includes the in-betweens. That includes like 2.5 and 3.7 and 4.1, and we don't want 4.1 shirts. So we only want a list of whole numbers that are positive um, going up from 1. That would be our domain. Okay. Now for our range, we want all the possible output values. And in this case, output is the cost of these shirts. Okay. So if you think about it, if I order one shirt, that's going to be 8 times 1, which is $8, plus $15. That's going to be $23. The cost for two shirts would be $8 more than that. So what this represents when you look at this function is $15 is like a flat fee. It's like a starting point or the y-intercept. It's just the, the amount of money that you have to pay. Sometimes when you order something, you have to pay you know, like a processing fee or something like that. So you got to pay $15 no matter how big your order it is, 
and then eight dollars per shirt after that. So um, the first order for one shirt would be eight dollars times one shirt, eight dollars plus that fifteen dollar fee, so twenty three dollars. Okay, now for the second shirt, it's just going to be eight dollars more than that. So twenty three plus eight would be thirty one, right? And then after that, you're going to have eight dollars more than that, which would be thirty nine. And after that, you're going to have eight dollars more than that, um, which would be forty seven. Okay, and so on. So we don't have a limit to how many shirts we can order. Probably not like you know a million, but um, it doesn't say here whether we're gonna if we have like a, a limit. But this is what our range would be. Okay, now notice I have spaces in between these, right? I don't want to have twenty five as an output value because twenty five dollars, that's not a, an amount that I can put in for an order. There's not a twenty five dollar order possibility because I can only order whole numbers of shirts. So these are, the, these are the, the amounts of money I can spend. I can't spend $50. I can spend $47 plus $8 or $55, but I can't spend $50. I can't spend $40. I can't spend $30. I can only spend $23 for one shirt, $31 for two, $39 for three, $47 for four, and so on. All right, so that's the, do the domain and range. Okay, now in the number two, these guys, what we're given here is we're given inputs, right? This is f of seven, that's how we would say it. And seven is the input value, this number here. So uh, again, down where it says like remember down here, when they give you something like this, they're giving you the input, but they don't know the output. So what this means here is take seven and plug it into your function. So f of 7 would be 8 times 7 plus 15, right, the input. Okay, and then we're just going to evaluate the right-hand side. That's going to be 56 plus 15, and that's going to be, uh, I think, 71 is what that comes out to be. Okay, now we want to interpret. So f of 7 is equal to 71. What does that mean in this context? Well, it means the price for seven shirts is $71. So cost of seven shirts is $71. So the directions say to evaluate the function at each value and then explain what it means in terms of the problem. So I evaluated the f function at seven for s equals seven. I got 71 and the it, interpretation of that is it was seven shirts that cost seventy one dollars and you're gonna do that same thing for the rest of these problem three is slightly different because problem three is not giving us the input notice that this looks a little bit different than this here I have a number on the inside of the parentheses I have the input here I don't have the number on the inside of the parentheses I have just an X there and then I have this other number on the outside so this number on the outside must be the output, or in this case, we're talking about $55. And what we want to find is the value of x that makes this equation true, right? The value of basically how many t-shirts we're going to have, okay? So I would take my function, this guy. Now notice we switched from s's to x's, and that's okay, that's no big deal. This might be just a specific number of t-shirts, whereas this s stands for like just a generic number. Um, so what I would do here is I would say, okay, 55 is the cost of my shirts, and I know that the cost of the shirts is $8 per shirt plus that $15 fee. Okay, so this is the setup, and I need to, I need to get x by itself. I want to find that value of x. Right? So I'm going to subtract 15 from both sides. That will give me 40 equals 8x. And then I'll divide both sides by 8 and then I'll give me 5 equals x. Okay, So that's the value of x I'm looking for. What does it mean? Explain what it means in terms of the problem. So you'd also want to write something that says the, the uh, number of shirts you can get for $55 is 5. So um, there's a couple ways you can write this, but let's just do it like this cost of five shirts is fifty five dollars okay 
So 5 is the number of shirts that corresponds with a cost of 55. So when they give you something that looks like this, they're giving you the output. They're giving you the y value, basically. And so what you want to do is your whole function is equal to that number. In this case, my whole function is equal to 175. Now again, it's a little confusing because they use s here and x here, but it doesn't really matter. Again, this x is representing a specific number of t-shirts for this $175, whereas this s is just representing any number of t-shirts that you want. So don't get too tripped up on that. Um, we're just going to use an x instead of an s, and we'll just solve it for x. So finish solving this one, figure out what it means in context, and write you know, a little statement, and then do the same thing here on C. Okay, now in this case, we don't have an equation, right? They say the function h of a represents average height of boys that are a years old, but there's no equation. What we do have, though, is a table, right? So we have this table. This table is what matches our inputs and outputs. Right? We can use an equation. Before we had an equation, this literal equation matches inputs and outputs because you put in an input and it'll give you out an output using like math and doing some operations. Here we don't have to do that though because we've, we're given a table of inputs and outputs. We still need function notation though because we have to be able to interpret what these things mean. So it says use the table to evaluate the function at each value. Explain what each means in terms of the problem. Same idea, we're just using a table instead of a function. So here, again, this notation with the, the number inside the parentheses is giving us the input. This is an age. So this is an age of seven. We want to find the height for age seven. So we look at the out input and we say, okay, the input is seven. What's the output? Okay, the height for somebody seven years old is about 49 inches on average. So h of seven is equal to 49. Okay, so again, we just kind of already said that in words. The height, average height for seven-year-old boy is 49 inches. Okay, so in all of these four problems, these four letters that go with number one, we're given an input. Okay. A couple things that you might notice about this table is that some of these entries are in months. But we know that A is supposed to stand for years. So 7 is years. This is 1.5 years. This is 11 years. This is 12.5 years. Right? So A, this number inside, needs to represent years. Well, if that's the case, we might want to translate these into years. So 6 months, that's half a year, right? Or 0 0.5 years. And 12 months is a full year. And then 18 months is a year and then six months. So this is about 1.5 years. So that's going to be helpful for this guy. Also, what you might notice here is they give us a 12.5. That's 12.5 years. And that doesn't show up in my table, but we can use some inference and say, well, 12.5 years is between 12 and 13 years. And so unless the average height of a boy is shrinking, then that height should probably be in between 59 and 61. All right, in number two for problem two, what we want is we want to find the value of A. We want to find an age. So notice in part A, I'm not given the age. It just says A. I don't know what A is. But what I am given is this guy, the output. In this case, that's height. Okay, so when I say 61, and that number is on the outside of the parentheses, on the other side of the equal sign, they're giving me the output. They're giving me a height. And I want to find the age that goes with that, right? And it's 13 years. So calculate the value of A that makes this true. What A will give you an output of 61? Well, if A equals 13, then that'll work. So in this case, they're giving you heights, right? and they want to know A. Here's a height, what was the age for that height? Here's a height, what's the age for that height? Here's a height, what's the age for that height? So the question here is a little bit different um, than these ones. It's basically backwards. Here they give you the input and ask for the output. Here they're giving you the output and they're asking you for the input. Okay, we need to explain what this means in terms of the problem. So 61 inches is the average height of a 13-year-old boy. 
61 inches is average height of 13 year olds. Maybe Y O for year old. Boy. Okay, it's a little small, so again, what that says is 61 inches is the average height of a 13-year-old boy. Not a whole lot of space on this, so if you want to write these on a separate sheet of paper, that's fine. This is for you to practice, so I would go through, finish these up, make sure you, you understand what's happening here, and this can go in your notebook for your notes. All right, and the last problem here is um, the same kind of idea, but with a graph. So a graph is another way we match input and output. Input would be like the x's, outputs would be the y's. Now these use different letters, right? These use d and t, but that's okay. This is the t axis, the time axis, and this is the d axis, the distance axis. So our inputs are t, time, and our outputs are d, distance. Okay. Um, so when it says d of 2, what they're giving me, again, is the input value. They're giving me 2 hours. So d of 2 says, what's the distance for 2 hours? Okay, so if we go to 2 hours and we go up to the graph, we say, oh, he's 4 miles away. So d of 2 is 4. Okay, again, explain what it ter means in terms of the problem. We need a little sentence here, okay? But basically, after 2 hours, Gulliver is going to be 4 miles from home. So after two hours, he's four miles from home. And that's the same for all these, right? We're given after, what's the distance for five hours? What's the distance for 2.9 hours? What's the distance for 10 hours? Okay, so 2.9 is kind of tricky, but here's two and here's three. 2.9 would be kind of in the in the middle between 2 and 3, but closer to 3. So probably about here. I'll let you finish that one up. Okay, now in number 2 of problem 3, we're given the opposite. We're given the distance, right? So the distance at t hours is equal to 2. So the distance is 2. They want us to find t. What is the t value that makes that true? So instead of going over the x-axis and looking up to the graph, what we're going to do is we're going to go over to the y-axis, or I guess it's the d-axis in this case, and we're going to see where the output is 2. Okay? So if you, if you go over to 2 and you look at the graph, there's actually two places where that happens. So there's two different values here. t could equal 1, right? because at 1 hour he's 2 miles away, or t could equal whatever this number is, somewhere between 9 and 10, maybe about 9.5. So t could equal 1 or t can equal 9.5, somewhere in between there. All right, so some of these are going to have two different values. Let's look at one more. d of t equals 5. Okay, so again, this is giving us the distance. The distance at time t is 5, 5 miles. So here's a distance of 5. There's actually two times that Gulliver is 5 miles away from home. Once at 4 hours and once over here at maybe eight and a half hours. According to this graph, as time goes on, Gulliver is getting farther away until he reaches a maximum distance of 11 miles. And then he starts coming back home and he gets, gets home around 10, after 10 hours. All right, so the pattern on this assignment is basically the same every time. The first question set for each section is going to give you inputs and ask you for outputs. And the second question set is going to give you the outputs and ask for the inputs. We can do that with a table, because that's a pairing of inputs and outputs. A graph is also a pairing of inputs and outputs. Or we can use an equation, because an equation can also help us pair inputs and outputs. Um, the equation requires a little bit of math. You have to do some operations, either evaluating or solving. Um, but the idea behind the notation is the same. So I hope that um, helps you out with your function notation. Okay, This is the, the notes for today. Again, go through practice. Um, finish it up if you need to. Okay, The homework for tonight is going to be this guy. 
So just more practice with function notation, just so we can, you know, make sure we're really good at, at these things. Um, so here in this first problem, this first set of problems, we're given a bunch of functions, right? F, G, H, and J. All of these things are asking us to evaluate the function at a given input value. So these numbers here inside the parentheses are input values. Okay, so let's just pick one out here. Let's do g of negative 4. What this is saying is your input or your x value is negative 4 and plug that into the g function. So we go up here to the g function and we say, okay, g of negative 4 is going to equal negative 4 squared minus 3. I just used this function x squared minus 3, but I replaced x with negative 4. So plug in negative 4 into the g function. All right, now when I plug in numbers, especially negative numbers, when I replace x, I always put them in parentheses so that I don't mess up that negative. In this case, if you do negative 4 and the negatives in parentheses and you square it, that's saying negative 4 times negative 4, which is what we want. And that would be 16 minus 3. So g of negative 4 is equal to 13. Um, so that's what you're going to do for these eight problems. You're just going to take the number inside and you're going to plug it into the function. You'll know which function to use based on the letter. Okay, these problems are going to be basically that same idea but backwards. Okay, so in this case they're saying find the value of x. We don't know x, we're not given the input, but they are giving us the output for which g of x equals 13. Well these are the same functions as we had before, right? And here's g of x. So if g, if g of x is equal to x squared minus 3, and they're also saying that g of x is equal to 13, that means I can replace this guy with 13. So I know 13 equals x squared minus 3. So I have the output, I'm going to replace this whole g of x, that whole section, with 13. And then I'm going to solve. So I have to get x by itself in this case. So plus 3, plus 3, I mean 16 equals x squared. And then we have to remember, how do we undo x squared? What's the inverse operation of x, of squared? Okay, inverse operation of squared is square root. Okay. So the square root and the square undo each other, that just gives me x on the right, and then the square root of 16 is 4. All right. So um, compare and contrast here. In the first eight problems, we're given x, and we need to evaluate to find the output. In the next four problems, we're given the output, and we need to solve in order to find the input. Okay, I'll let you guys finish those on your own. The next couple problems are very, very similar to what we had in the practice, the, the notes for today. They're just a table here and a graph here. Different ways of representing a function. Okay, so these are all inputs and they're asking us to find the output. In this case we're talking about a bus um, at T hours, okay. Now again, we we might want to have to tr we might want to translate a little bit. So, 0.25 hours. That's a quarter of an hour, which would be 15 minutes. So sometimes minutes and hours is confusing because you think 0.25 hours should be 25 minutes, but it's actually not because there's not a hundred minutes in an hour. There's only 60. So 0.25 would be 15 minutes after 8 a.m. Right. So one of the things we might want to do here is just translate these into um, actual times. So zero hours after 8 a.m. is 8 a.m. Right, And this is 0.25 hours or 15 minutes after 8 a.m. So this would be like 8.15. Okay, this would be half an hour after 8. So that would be like 8.30. And this is one hour after 8, so that's 9. Okay, so you might want to translate these into actual times. Okay, so if we go down here and we look at, we're looking for B of zero, that's the number of people on the bus, zero hours after 8 a.m. 
Okay, so if we go to zero, right? Zero is the number we're looking for, and that corresponds to 33 people. So b of zero equals 33. That means there are 33 people on the bus at 8 a.m. Okay, so in your explanation, you probably want to have a time instead of a, a number of hours. That probably makes more sense. But when they give you these, these are going to be numbers of hours. So 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 1.75, 1.75, 4, 4. These are the inputs that you need to use in the table. But when we write our explanation, we probably want to have a time instead of a number of hours. Okay, down here, this is asking for what time are there 25 people on the bus? Or what is T? How many... Uh, hours have passed from 8 a.m. when there's 25 people on the bus. So again, this is giving you the output value, the right-hand side, and you need to go back and find the left-hand side. Keep in mind that there might be more than one time where there was that number of people on the bus. So there could be more than one answer for these two. Okay, last one is this graph. So we have a graph of pH levels of a pond D days after July 15th. Okay, so let's look at one of these here. P of 8. Okay, so that's 8 days after July 15th. What is the pH? So the pH for 8 days, we're going to go over here to 8, that give us the input. That's going to be 6.1, a pH of 6.1. Okay, so what I would say is the pH is 6.1 on, now remember 8 was a number of days, but it's days after July, 20, uh, July 15th. So if I go eight days later, that would be July 23rd. The pH is 6.1 on July 23rd. So again, these are numbers of days. That corresponds to the, the input or the x's down here. But when we translate this into real, you know, a, a sentence, instead of saying the pH is 6.1 eight days after July 15th, it might just be easier to say on July 23rd. Okay, now this one here, they're saying, okay, the pH is 6.1. What are the number of days that correspond with that pH? But keep in mind, on some of these, there could be more than one. There could be two different days where the pH was 6, and we want to find all of those different things. So once again, here you're given input and asked to find the output. Here you're given the output and you're asked to find the input, and then interpret that in this context. Tell me what that means about days and pH. Okay, so that should help you get through your, uh, your notes for today and also get you a head start on your assignment. This assignment will be turned in via Canvas. So um, yeah, I hope that helps and I'll see you guys back in class soon.